We're here with Norman McLean, one of the glues that keeps the New York sports community together. Glue? Sports writer, radio commentator, television commentator, worked as a beer vendor in the Polo Grounds, uh, commissioner of the Eastern Hockey League for a little while, a man with an extensive history, but for historical purpose, probably most interesting is possibly the last New York Americans fan still alive. Well, I was in the polo grounds when Bobby Thompson hit his home run, and that still is my biggest thrill in a, as a fan, in a sense, which I never have been really because I was always working. But the number two date in my history is March 27th, 1938, which really is March 28th, I might add, because it's 60-40 of overtime, Lawn Carr of the New York Americans scored and beat the New York Rangers, the lordly New York Rangers, and knocked them out of the playoffs two games to one. Now, that was a first-round playoff that game. That was a first-round playoff, and the next time the Rangers played a two out of three, the New York Islanders beat them in 11 seconds of overtime, two games to one. They went from the longest game in the history of Madison Square Garden to the shortest overtime game in the history of Madison Square Garden. The Rangers kept coming out on the bottom end of it every time. You know, everyone forgets the old Madison Square Garden, which it was, to bring it to the modern context, uh, the new garden opening in February of 1968, uh, so you're dealing with almost 30 years. But it was very similar to the Boston Garden, which people are a little more familiar with now, with overhanging balconies. This would be the third garden, which was yes. located on, on 8th Avenue between 49th and 50th Street. Where they now have a $3 movie. Right. <laughs> and, and shops in a mall. That garden, with its overhanging balconies, was a very curious situation in that the people in the first row of that balcony had the best view anywhere for any sporting event, they looked straight down and it was right there. But they stood up. And the people in the second row stood on the chairs and leaned on their backs. And the people in the third row stood on the back of the chairs and leaned on their backs. And these were general admission rush seats because outside of the first row, you really couldn't see the whole ice or the whole basketball court, I might add. Now, when you but say a general admission rush sheet, you mean- 40 first cents. Uh, and a little uh, earlier than that, it was 25 cents, 15 cents geo. Then it went up, to, and it was, we were aghast when it was raised to 40 cents <laughs> for the 25 cent geo student price. And the way the garden ran it, as opposed to today when you have security making $150 a night or something, uh, they had no cops on either of the two side balconies. The end balconies where you could see all the ice, but quite a distance away, were reserved at a dollar and a quarter, and they had cops there. Mm -hmm. These were, these were policed by ourselves. If you threw something, you were out. And about eight people were allowed in before the general admission rush to organize the 88 seats on each side, 49th and 50th Street side. And then they selected, usually for a quarter, I might add, uh, the, who would sit in those seats. And the whole thing ran smoothly for over 35 years that way. <laughs> Now, let me guess, you were related to somebody who was one of those privileged well, My few. father helped open the garden. The New York Americans preceded the New York Rangers by a year, and he helped open that and sell seats and get things going, and, and he was a big part of it, and always was an Americans fan, as opposed to the Rangers, who charged the Americans $25,000, which was tremendous money then, rental each game, which in effect is really what put the Americans out of business at the point of the war. Now, uh, the Americans came first. They were a, a bastard franchise from someplace else, weren't they? They were sort well, of Well, the, 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 the Rangers actually uh, were created from the West. The Americans were the Hamilton Bulldogs. Uh, of, from, of the and NHL. They, and the, amazingly, they went on strike in February the year before, and, and the next game they played was in New York. <laughs> right. They, 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 in, at the end of the 24-25 season, they finished first in the league that year. And wouldn't they? play and wouldn't play in the playoffs. Over money. Over now, money. Nothing's changed. I mean, it, it may have been $10 then, and it's $100,000 now, or, or $10 billion now, whatever it is, but nothing's changed. It, it's and, 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 and as I remember it, they had, finished, they had finished first in the league, 
but the season had gotten stretched by six games that year, and they were playing under the contracts that said right. they get paid the same and, amount of money. Every and year. Bill Dwyer, a noted uh, New York bootlegger, remember, liquor was illegal in those days, <laughs> was the original owner of the New York Americans with all of the, what that uh, means. Right, and um, had... Celebrity Row you, had uh, Al Capone in it at one point, <laughs> if there was such a thing. Yeah, the Americans were kind of notorious for being a rough bunch. Well, the Americans were without the success of the Oakland Raiders, but they were the Oakland Raiders of, of, of the sports world at that point, picking up over-the-hill uh, semi-bum, shall we say. <laughs> now, they had some big names, too. Eddie Shaw played for the American team. Uh, at the tail end of his career, at the same time owning Springfield of the American Hockey League and commuting and playing back and forth and having the paperwork sent in every day. They just sent offshore back down, they brought shore <laughs> back up, you know, which was totally ridiculous. But, uh, and they had Sweeney Schreiner, who won a scoring championship with Toronto, of course. Right. Now, Lorn Carr, our hero, went on and played a long time in the NHL and won a Stanley Cup later in the 40s with Toronto Maple Leafs. He was a genuine... Uh, real good player. And you know who was perhaps the Americans' best player? Who? A, a famous ranger. Charlie you see, Rayner, probably. That's exactly it. Bonnie Prince Charlie Rayner played his first two seasons in the National Hockey League as a New York American and would have been a New York American had they resumed yeah. when, the war, when World War II was over. Yeah, let's just talk. I want to talk a little bit about the history of the Americans from start to finish. They play the first year in the Garden. And the Garden sees this as a great success. The, well, they the drew well, and, and they, they, they saw the excitement of it. The six-day bike races were important at that time. College baskets wasn't until 1933-34. You had an empty building, you had, and you had boxing on every Friday night, the, you know, the bum of the week, you might say. Mm -hmm. uh, they needed dates. To, they needed to fill dates. Never mind fill the summer. They needed to fill the winter. Uh, and it, it, they, so they put their own team in there. And, and Connie Smythe organized the original New York Rangers and got in an argument with management and got fired. And then they brought in Lester Patrick, who simply superbly handled Smythe's players. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Americans were, the first year of the Americans, they finished last but drew well anyway. Right. Okay. The game sold. The, thing. the Americans, all, they didn't finish last every year, but remember, uh, the, the, but that first year they finished last, the even though they had a lot of... The pre-war league NHL had seven teams, and six made the playoffs. Mm -hmm. The Americans usually finished sixth or seventh. Right. <laughs> and that was all there was to it. The Blackhawks used to give them a little uh, uh, competition for... Well, and the Canadians out of the problems. And the Canadians in 42-43 finished out of the playoffs, too. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were also a weak team because uh, Montreal, the market was split for a long time with the English-speaking Montreal Maroons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, you're dealing with things, but the Americans were basically a downtrodden team, right. much more downtrodden than the, the 40s and 50s Rangers. <laughs> the, 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 the Americans, when they started, had a couple of pretty good players. They had a kid from born in Yonkers who was the league MVP one year, Billy Birch. Right? Billy Birch, yes. Hey, Billy Birch. There was, there was some thinking on Dwyer's part to, to go and get Americans, but it, it, it never really... Uh, panned out completely. Mm -hmm. They had uh, Roy Waters in goal for a while, and his uh, claim to fame is he's the first goalie that the, somebody took a uh, long shot, there's no slap shots then, but somebody took a long shot from just over the blue line, and it hit the, the red light behind the goal, bounced back, hit Waters in the head, bounced off his shoulder, hit him in the rump, and bounced into the <laughs> net for the only goal of the game, <laughs> one nothing. <laughs> so, you know, something... They were the Brooklyn Dodgers of the National Hockey League. Something always happened bad to the New York Americans, who mm -hmm. incidentally wore beautiful uniforms, star-spangled, a flag on the, their shoulders, you might say. Mm -hmm. And the Rochester Americans, presently in the American Hockey League, the champions last year, have a similar type of uniform. Now, Americans fans, like your father and like you, were always bitterly resentful of the Rangers coming in. Uh, although I've worked for the Rangers for a long time, uh, and did color on their TV, which what John Davidson does now, and with the aid of Amor Francis and John Muckler, developed the Metropolitan Junior Hockey Association for 17 years, and it still exists, and it's got 400 and some odd kids went to college, and 22 went to the National Hockey League. I've always hated the Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other way to put it. And, uh, and it goes I may back. have, I may have uh, 
done some uh, scouting in 94 that was not for the Rangers during the uh, playoffs. Let's put it that way. <laughs> might have. Okay, might have. we're going to come. I mean, I'm not allowed to do that as a journalist, so I might have. Okay, well, we're going to come back to that in a little while. Um, but I guess basically, Americans fans always viewed the Rangers as Johnny Come Latelys, who. Well, they owned the building. They were part of the building, Madison Square Garden Corporation. So, although it wasn't the Rangers, meaning Lester Patrick per se, mm -hmm. of billing the the Americans twenty five thousand for the game, he certainly <laughs> knew about it. It was Madison Square Garden Corporation. But as far as we were concerned, it was one of the same. It was all the same. And and, and the the Americans' bill for for was like twenty five hundred. That's the rental that the, the garden charged the Rangers, the Rangers, and they charged the Americans twenty five thousand. Now you're dealing with. People were making uh, twenty-five dollars a week. You got to you got to understand. I mean, that was a tremendous amount of money. Now the Rangers and Americans actually played two playoff series, didn't they? Yes, and the, Amer the Rangers won one, and the Americans won one. Okay, the first one was a was a series where the only goal of the series was scored at uh, twenty-nine fifty of overtime by Butch Keeling. Did your of father the Rangers. of yeah. the Rangers? Did your father ever talk about that? No, not not that much. Uh, and he did, he. Came to my father died in 1979. Uh, after the Rangers had won the first game against Montreal in their run that year, and wasn't his last words, but it was spoken on his last day. Don't let the Rangers win the cup. <laughs> and he flashed back, and he. But my father came to the realization over the years that the Americans were doomed no matter what happened because they really never had an owner. Mm -hmm. They were owned by the league the last three years. They became the so-called Brooklyn Americans at one point, just trying to create the Dodger Giant rivalry and sell a few tickets, you know. And although we did not wish to admit this, Ranger crowds that were always over 10,000. Mm -hmm. The building wasn't sold out like everybody wants, you know. The building, now, now in Pittsburgh, they get mad in the, uh, in the playoffs when there's 48,000, there should be 52,000. It wasn't that way back in those days. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the Americans grew seven or eight thousand all the time. The Rangers eleven or twelve. But but and but th th that was a, that's so, a lot of money. You know. So so Dwyer at some point sold the team, yeah. or it was. Dirty. But there was five different owners between twenty six and by the time the league took it over, when Red Dutton, mm -hmm. who who later became the it was Red Dutton at one point, was the president and owner and defenseman and captain and coach of the, <laughs> of the New York Americans. <laughs> now, you know, uh, and he had his own money into it and he, he, threw in the, he threw in the towel on it because he lost to me. He lost something like $250,000 uh, of 1938, 39 money, mm -hmm. which that's considerable uh, for a player to lose. Mm -hmm. And I think what the league did is made him the president and, and he was a good president for the two years, but he really wanted to go back out west and live. That's why Clarence Campbell eventually succeeded him. I think the league made some sort of a payment to him under the guise of presidential service, but also trying to get his money back. And he got a good chunk of it back. Because they understood he kept a, a New York franchise going. Now, in 1941-42, which was the last year of the American <laughs> existence, Rangers finished first overall Sugar in the league. Sugar Jim Henry and goal right. for and the that, Rangers. And then they lose to Toronto, in the, and Toronto ends up winning the Stanley Cup. The Americans finished seventh. The Out. Brooklyn Americans finished seventh in a seven-team league. Out. Out. Out for good or out for the duration of World Supposedly War II? Supposedly for the duration, but uh, no one was surprised when, when uh, it was announced that they weren't coming back. They had no owner. The league owned them. So, and, and the league was the sixth. Own, you know, the, the NHL at that point probably was called the Norris House League. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Jim Norris owned one team and his sister owned another, and Jim Norris owned the Boston Garden and Madison Square Garden. That's four votes out of six. Right. The, the two teams involved with Detroit and Chicago. So, so no matter what the Canadian teams did or stood on their head, uh, uh, even though Montreal had, uh, had uh, territorial rights to all the French players, which helped them tremendously, uh, the, the vote in the political arena was four to two, and the Ranger management did not. General John Reed Kilpatrick, who is wearing Rangers down his shirt, is you know did not want a rival here. Nobody, you know, as the war, World War II ended, no one knew there would be sellouts. The the, the Ranger franchise itself was in danger 
and the Rangers fan club was formed in 1950 because the crowds were seven and 8,000. And the Rangers played a few games in other venues than Madison Square Garden. Chicago played games in St. Louis and Minneapolis in the early 50s, league games. Right. So this whole, they did not want competition at that point. And they pushed them out. Now, Red Dutton apparently was quite Red bitter Dutton was about the president this. In the, just before Campbell was 45, 46 in that area, and then he retired to the West. Right. Now, Dutton had owned, Dutton had managed the Americans up until the end of the 42 season. Right. Then gets a couple of months off. Frank Calder, the president of the league since its founding, uh, has a heart attack in Montreal and, Dutton and dies. The Dutton becomes the president. Dutton serves to the end of the war with the understanding that Campbell is going to become the president. When he comes when back he comes from Rhodes Scholar, coming back from the distinguished service during the war, and the the, I guess today they call it a balloon payment, but the league made up Dutton's losses to him uh, with the Americans, and, and Dutton was therefore pleased to get out from something that he, you know. But there's always been talk that Red Dutton, when the Rangers blocked his return into the league, or blocked the Americans' return into the league, cursed the Rangers somehow. Oh, I'm sure he did. I, I mean, he had put his blood, heart, and soul into it, and it is not impossible that with the closed doors that the settlement was only made to pacify him and make him go away peaceable, as opposed to maybe legal action or, or uh, you know, as the president of the league in one form and suing somebody else in New York in another form, he might have been able to put it through, but he had no capital left. He had no money. What he needed was find four or five angels, and I guess he just didn't work hard enough at it to do it. But supposedly there was a curse. Oh, no. There was Dutton's a curse. curse. Yeah, what was Dutton's curse? Well, Dutton's curse is that the, the, the Rangers will never win the Stanley Cup as, as long as I'm alive. And, and, they, and they didn't. And they did. <laughs> Dutton died, I think, in 87, yeah, right? They and, didn't. They absolutely didn't. And uh, that's something similar to what happened out in Chicago when uh, there was a... when Pete Muldoon. Pete Muldoon was fired by Major McLaughlin, the owner of the Blackhawks, and Muldoon put a curse on the on the Black Fox, and <laughs> Bobby Hull and Stan Mikita managed to change that <laughs> in 1960. <laughs> now Muldoon was the coach for the first year, yeah. and he was, they finished, I think, a game over 500, and then, you know, were eliminated well, from the playoffs, and he got Major fired. Major Blackland was ahead of his time and wanted to use Americans, and the Black Hawks, for a long time, in the 30s, used quite a few Americans. Uh, Johnny Mariucci, Cully Dahlstrom, Mush Mosh. Mike Caracas. Mike Caracas, the goalie, right. and the coach, Bill Stewart, who was, Bill Stewart is famous in baseball thing. What, what did Bill Stewart do in baseball? Well, it? you're going to tell me, but he uh, was the umpire at second base. Bill Stewart on... was picked off by Bob Fella as well as Bill Macy, <laughs> Bill Macy, and he blew the call. But Bill Stewart, 10 years earlier, was the manager of the Chicago Blackhawks, who finished sixth and won the Stanley Cup in the, in the finals, the famous Alfie Moore game in in Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens, Caracas, an American from the Iron Range up in Minnesota, broke his ankle in the pre in pregame. Stopped the shot, you know, he couldn't, he was out. Well, in, of course, in those days there was no second goalie, and the custom was that the, the home team had a house goalie. House goalie was a high school kid, a junior kid, or an old man, somebody that was used in practice as the other goalie at the other end. Well, that goalie happened to be Alfie Moore, uh, who was being paid $10 a game as the, the backup house goalie. And Alfie had been the Pittsburgh, Toronto slum team goalie that year, beaten out by Turk Broder quite easily. And he was uh, very much in his cups and drank up the $10 <laughs> across the street in the bar. <laughs> and he was in no better shape to play than you are right now. <laughs> when the Maple Leafs sent for him and he came over and wobbled back into the building. And Stewart went crazy. He jumped Connie Smythe and he says, this is what you're doing to me? <laughs> you're giving me a drunk. <laughs> you know, Smythe says, that's what the rules are. I didn't tell him what to do today. So to make a long story short, they poured coffee into Alfie Moore and he went out there. The first shot from center ice goes in and the Maple Leafs are all laughing, you know. Well, to make, now to make a real long story short, 47 saves later, Chicago won the game three to one and Moore skated off the ice giving the uh, finger and everything else in all place, including <laughs> Smythe, and the Black Hawks gave him a full share, brought up another goalie and won this cup. <laughs> and a full share, which then was a little over $1,000, was a lot of money because he probably made 3000 for the year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, imagine uh, Cecil Fielder 
making his nine million and getting, uh, you know, three million for, three. for one game, <laughs> something like that. And um, now Alfie Moore ended up on the Americans, didn't he? Alfie Moore is uh, on my wall is a picture of Alfie Moore in American uniform. Even another one of these recycled. Uh, you know, when there were six teams and seven teams, it was hard. You, you're talking about the seven best goalies in the world, right. uh, and there was goalies who were close, but they didn't get a shot if nobody got hurt. And mm -hmm. and the goalies in the NHL, they played hurt. There wasn't the slap shots. There wasn't the tips in front of the net. It was really the 30s hockey was soccer on skates, five passes and they hoped for a tap in. Uh, you know, like mm -hmm. the Europeans first came over. Now the Europeans have adjusted, but. Uh, and that's why there was no good European goalie until Dominic Hasek. None of them really, well, Pelly Lindbergh made it and then got killed. But, but other than Pelly Lindbergh, which was a year and a half, so who knows if he did make it. But uh, Trediak really didn't make it here. Trediak's reputation, I believe, is a little overblown. Uh, he messed up that game in 1980 in, in Lake Placid. He dumped the rebound in front, carelessly in front, and Johnson put it in, tying the game, and his coach blew it by pulling him out in, in an emotional thing. And, but Tradiak and his predecessors, uh, uh, Goran Hagasta, people of that nature. Hardy Astrom. Yeah, Hardy Astrom <laughs> uh, of a Ranger fame, with the, the pimple-faced Hardy Astrom, were excellent in, in, on close in plays and tremendous gymnasts, which has to give. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't, when they, weren't, they weren't ready when somebody came over the blue line and blasted away. You know, it just wasn't done. So the, 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 the making goal in the NHL then was really a tough job. Now, thir 30s hockey was a lot different than present day hockey in black, part because. Black Pepsi-Cola Cola Ice. Black Pepsi-Cola Cola Ice. Uh, especially in water shortages, which came up, and especially during the war, when there was a, they automatically said there was a water shortage and tried to save everything. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, it was, and, not, and the rinks, 200 by 85 was considered a huge rink then. The old garden was not 183 by 85, something like that. That's quite different. The, the, the minor league rinks, the one in Springfield, was, was what I call it a bowling alley with nets. You know, you could just back up and angle the guy off to the, as a defenseman, angle the guy off to the corner and forget it now. So your, your players were coming up from smaller rinks. Uh, everybody thought the Buffalo's rink before the new building was tiny in the Boston Gardens. And they, they are by comparative today's standards, but those were regular sized rinks then. So the rinks were much smaller and the, the people were smaller. The, the, the people, it was a stick handler's game. You didn't headman the puck. The, the Montreal Canadiens in the 40s slowly evolved it into the headmanning of the puck. But you, you didn't headman the puck or anything of that nature. One guy would, like an Eddie Shaw, would take it and try to rush it length, the length of the rink. And it was really three people, with the possible exception of Shaw once in a while adding in, trying to score on six. Because the two defensemen stayed back. Sometimes on their own blue line, their own blue line, not the the other blue line, to a great degree. Now, is there, w w th there were rules that, uh, this, that prohibited headman passing Well, up no, to the blue line point. wasn't put in until 1943-44. Uh, the, 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 the red line. The red line, my fault. The red line wasn't put in, and Frank Boucher put the red line in of the Rangers, and I really think it hurt his own team because he had nobody could, could, could handle it that way. He could skate the wartime team, but he put that in, and, and it did open it up. You could at least pass up to the to the center ice red line. Before that, you had to work it out zone by zone. But you were allowed to forward pass within a zone. Yeah, well, in, in the late 20s, 29, there was, a, there was a forward passing all over the ice, like basketball. You could mm -hmm. literally ice the puck. The word ice the puck isn't accurate, but you could send it to the other end, and if it was touched before the icing line, it was good. Mm -hmm. And the, sky, the scoring skyrocketed, and the goalies, were, there was three on nothings and things like that, so they, they went got away from that after one year. Yeah, the Canadians used that, Georges and uh, uh, Howie Morenz and, and Oreo Joliet and Black Cat Gagnon made big use of that. They had all sorts of carom plays uh, in the forum. You could, see that was another disadvantage the Americans had and the Rangers had in that the, there was, eventually the circus would come in, they couldn't play home playoff game, and there was, there was a lot of various cultural shows uh, there was college basket. So when college basketball took hold in the 30s, 33, 34, it got a lot of dates. It got 48 double headers. You know, that's a lot of a lot of time in there. They did not have the system of the, keeping the ice down at that point. You were putting fresh ice in all the time. You're skating on concrete. 
and you couldn't practice there. The Rangers and Americans, the Americans used to practice in Springfield, Massachusetts in the late 30s because that's where Eddie Shaw had hit the Springfield Indians and fought. And there was many a day that the Americans played the Indians in practice and then they both went in separate directions. And, oh yeah, that, that's weird, but it, <laughs> Springfield isn't that far. If you, you, know, you put them in a bus and, and run them down. So it's a completely different era. There's, there's no other way to say it. Looking back and having matured, and not with my youthful zest of just rooting for my Americans, they, were, they never had a chance, they never had the, the capital, and they were doomed from the start. In, an, in a situation that at that time called for one team. In New York. In New York, yeah. Now, let me just back up to the 1938 playoffs, and then we're going to leave the Americans for good. Americans and Rangers both finished second in their divisions. The Americans at the time played in the Canadian division. Yeah, that was, that was another weird thing. But that happens now, like Atlanta plays in the West in various leagues and everything. Uh, they just kept juggling divisions all the time. And some of that was done on, politi on a political basis to, like the Blackhawks, finished first for a long time in, in, uh, in the NHL because they were in the right division with no real competition. And they always, they always gave the Americans the toughest division and the Rangers were in the easiest division and I still say that. <laughs> and they change it from year to year sometimes. I mean, that's not fair. You know, let it work itself out. Depends where the votes are. That's what <laughs> it it depends where the votes are and the Americans never had the votes. Um, but in, that, in, the, in the first round of that 38 uh, playoff between the Rangers and the Americans, the Americans win the first game and the Rangers win the second game. And then the Rangers take a 2 nothing lead into the third period of the third game. And what happens then? They, they just turned it on. I think, the, I think uh, Ching Johnson made two mistakes in, in particular. Uh, no, no, not Ching. Um, Muzz, Muzz, Muzz. Muzz is Muzz it. Patrick. Muzz Patrick, yeah. He turned it over twice. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that. And uh, the Americans tied it, and then they just ground on. And, you know, you were dealing then with three lines. Three lines, not four. And four defensemen. And in the, in, by the third overtime, it w they were so tired, both teams, that the players were taking themselves off. Whoever could get to the bench, his man would take, you know, and it, there was no lines or anything left. It was just whoever had the strength to keep going. Mm -hmm. there, there was no strategy left. It was just, uh, if you had a spare who hadn't played, he didn't want to put around the ice, he didn't want to walk up the ice. And, and if you notice, the, the goal was scored after an intermission. Right, it was when, when they had sat down and rested for 10 minutes or so. And maybe, maybe somebody had a little pep. Yeah. And it was uh, 40 seconds, 40 seconds of, the, into the, of the fourth overtime. Now that is true even today. You tend to find the goals after you have an over, you know, two or three overtimes. The goals tend to get scored very early or they just don't get no, scored. So, yeah, they, they tend to score in the first three minutes or goals and goals and goals. Mm -hmm. uh, and even, even the famous Easter Day game of the Islanders and the Capitals. That really was a freak goal. Uh, right, it was a turnaround shot by LaFontaine. Yeah, on a rebound, one. the defenseman stopped the shot, and he came back, and, he, and, and uh, he, Mason was screened. And it, hit the, it went past because he didn't see it. It hit the mm -hmm. crossbar and went in. You know. mm -hmm. It wasn't three passes. It wasn't a picture play. It just something happened. And I always say in overtime now, keep shooting. Something right. might happen. Mm -hmm. The picture passing doesn't, doesn't really happen. Okay, so the, now, so Lauren Carr scores at 40 seconds of the fourth overtime. Americans now move on to play Chicago, and they probably ought to beat them. Well, ought have been, should have been, would have been, uh, all of the rest of that, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. And, and, that and, and you know something? Uh, now, I'm only eight years old, and I'm 67 now, but we were disappointed. But I think beating the Rangers was their Super Bowl, was their Stanley Cup, mm -hmm. and, and I think that they didn't prepare as well as they could have. They didn't take it as seriously. You weren't dealing with the level of money that you are today by any means. Uh, maybe a couple of the older guys wanted to go play golf. Who knows? You know, I, I, I think they just, they were surprised they got there and they, their, their whole life was to beat the Rangers. Because the Rangers absolutely crapped on them. I mean, the, the Americans would have a practice in the garden if it was possible or something. And if the Rangers wanted to usurp it when the Americans got there, they, they just were told you can't go on the ice. I mean, you know, it was a, a very, very back-of-the-bus, second-class citizen arrangement. Mm -hmm. So there was a rivalry on a managerial level as well as on a player Absolutely. level. Absolutely. And it was just, it was like the, 
it was like the Islanders and the Rangers were for a while, except that I don't think the Ranger players and the Ranger management took the Americans as seriously as the present Rangers players and management took the Islanders. But then the Americans didn't win four cups in a row or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they were total second-class citizens. They compared to the Brooklyn Dodgers of the same era. Uh, 